Welcome to today's webinar, Innovations and Challenges, Colorado and Beyond. This webcast was a partnership with our friends across the hall here at WICHE, the Western Alliance of Community College Academic Leaders and the Western Academic Leadership Forum. My name is Megan Raymond and I lead programs, events and sponsorship here at WCET. I just celebrated my 15 year milestone, so I'm thrilled to have marked that special occasion. So thank you for being here to join us. We've been on this journey for a long, long time. And this is one of the highlights of my job. I get to bring together amazing people to share what they're doing with you all. As we go through today, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box and our moderator will be sure to get to those. The slides are available and we are recording this. We'll share the link and any resources back out with you later this week or early next week. If you wanna participate in the Twitter chat, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Now I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Olivia Tufo, who's the Member Services Coordinator at WICHE. Olivia. Hi everyone. Uh, I am Olivia Tufo. I'm the Member Services Coordinator for Academic Leadership Initiatives at WICHE, which means that I support members of the Western Academic Leadership Forum, the Western Alliance of Community College Academic Leaders, and our Interstate Passport Network members. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to introduce the moderator of our session today, Landon Pirius. He's the chair of the Alliance, as well as the vice chancellor for academics and student affairs with the Colorado Community College System. At CCCS, Dr. Pirius provides strategic leadership for all aspects of academic affairs, student affairs, online education, workforce development, and institutional research. Thank you all for being with us today. Landon, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Great, thank you, Olivia. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon if you happen to be in a different time zone. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I'm here with four of my colleagues here in, in the Colorado Community College System, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, the topic of our presentation and our panel is really kind of looking at the landscape of community colleges. Uh, we'll talk a lot, you'll hear a lot about Colorado, but I think a lot of what you'll hear will be applicable to community colleges across the country. Um, a lot of the challenges that we're facing around decreased enrollment due to the pandemic, especially a disproportionate decrease in enrollment among underrepresented students. Um, we're, we're faced with state funding challenges. And while the state of Colorado has increased state funding for higher education for the last two years, it's largely to just cover costs. Um, and that doesn't cover the decreases in tuition, or excuse me, the tuition coming from enrollment um, or other sorts of things that are coming up. We also are seeing an infusion of federal dollars as, um, as it relates to um, the pandemic. And those are welcome, but they also come along, especially this last legislative session with a lot of additional priorities and projects and initiatives that legislators wanna see through um, that get placed on top of the colleges um, at a time when there's a lot of initiative fatigue, a lot of um, burnout, and frankly, what we just learned uh, last week in our system is that at many of our colleges, over 20% of their employees have turned over in the last year. And so a number of challenges that are going on within the community colleges. Um, and so this requires our leaders um, to really look at, their, at what they're doing as institutions, the programmatic mix that they might have, which new programs they might wanna offer, which programs they might wanna close, which new markets they might wanna pursue or double down on. It might be adult students or more concurrent enrollment students and what new partnerships or expanded access opportunities that they might engage in um, in their local communities um, to both attract additional students, but also to better serve the communities um, where they are located. So today we're gonna to hear from four different presidents. You can see them up on the screen today. Two of those presidents are just finishing their first year. Um, 
And um, so that'll be an interesting um, perspective to hear from them um, compared to um, the other two who have been in uh, their roles a little longer. Um, but they'll share with you a little bit of what they are doing or what their colleges are doing in terms of strategies and approaches to address the, the higher ed landscape that they're seeing in their communities and, and in Colorado. But I'm gonna let each one of them introduce themselves um, and talk a little bit about their colleges. And so I'm going to start with you, Rhonda, if you would um, introduce yourself. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. It is great to be here with my witchy and my WCET colleagues. And I just have to say, um, first of all, that both of these are special organizations to me because I really started my career in the online space way, way back in the early 1990s. Uh, it was pre-internet and it was when we were talking about distance learning and it was all primarily video based. And WCET was kind of my anchor as far as professional organizations go for a couple of decades. And Wichi also has figured prominently in my past work um, with SHEO, with the Colorado Department of Higher Ed, and uh, I even worked for a brief time at Wichi. And then among this panel, I, I think I'm probably the longest serving in the Colorado Community College system. I've been in various roles um, here at CCCS for about 20 years, except for a couple of years that I spent at CDHE and at WICHE. I've been a provost at Community College of Denver. I was at the system office in a couple of different roles with CCC Online and also in Academic Affairs. And now I'm president at Trinidad State College. So uh, I'll share with you just a little bit about Trinidad State College. We are in rural Southern Colorado, about 13 miles from the New Mexico border. We have two campuses, one in Trinidad, which is a residential campus where we are home to 12 athletic programs and also many excellent academic and CTE programs. And then we have another campus in Alamosa, which is in the San Luis Valley, about 110 miles from our Trinidad campus. We serve about 2,000 students each year, primarily from the eight counties of our service area, as well as Northern New Mexico. We are over 40% Hispanic, and we're proud that our success rates for our Hispanic students are just about equal to that of our white students. Um, our strengths are in nursing. We are offering a bachelor's uh, of science in nursing, teacher education, and then a host of CTE programs like gunsmithing, which is one of our more well-known programs, line tech, automotive, welding, construction, and law enforcement. And then we're also reviving our performing and visual arts programs in support of the growing creative industries in the Trinidad area. Um, and then we also have a new trail building program in support of the growing outdoor recreation industry on both of our campuses. Um, we were asked to say something that's unique about our college. And so in addition to the programs I just mentioned, I'll say that one of the things that's unique about Trinidad State College is just the stunning beauty of our service area. Everything from the new Fishers Peak State Park um, in Trinidad to the Great Sand Dunes in the San Luis Valley to the Cachara Valley. If you have never spent time in this part of Southern Colorado, which I hadn't until I moved here three years ago, you really should come visit. So that's my introduction and I'll hand it over to one of my colleagues. Hey, thank you, Rhonda. Um, I'm so looking forward to that new state park. Um, so when I come down this fall, that's one of the things I'm going to try to hit. Um, uh, Mordecai? Yes, yes. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you may be located. Grateful for the opportunity to be with you all. Uh, bring you greetings uh, from uh, Community College of Aurora, uh, where as of May 20th, we turned 39 years young and uh, we're just getting started. We're a vibrant young institution, the youngest in the system. So I think that's part of a, a unique uh, um, aspect in terms of the characteristics and, and, and uh, partnership with our other 12 sister colleges. I'll tell you that uh, here we have over 10,000 uh, students. 
Uh, I will tell you that 66% of our students are students of color, uh, which is uh, making us uh, pound for pound. We, we say the most diverse uh, college in the state of Colorado. Uh, over 50% of our students are first generation. 51% uh, of our students are Pell recipients. And so as we think about the communities in which we serve um, here in the Aurora uh, community, as well as um, parts of the uh, Denver and Centennial area as well, our particular communities historically um, have been underserved communities. And so we have uh, worked uh, very hard in our particular community to uh, create opportunities for social and economic mobility for our students. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, in this session, uh, but we have a keen eye and focus to social services and what we're providing for our community. Um, proud to say that we are making uh, rebounds and climbs from an enrollment standpoint. When the pandemic first uh, occurred, we had a 12% decline in enrollment uh, last fall, 7% climb back. Currently today, right now, uh, if we were to close registration, we would have uh, finally climbed back from our original um, impact of enrollment. So we continue to work very hard uh, in our students in terms of closing those equity gaps, those success gaps. Proud to share that in comparison to this time last year, we've improved our student success rates by 27.1%. So we'll continue to do the work of uh, creating new opportunities for our students, and we're excited to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mordecai. And if your college is the youngest, Rhonda, yours is the oldest. Um, what is 1925? Uh, 1925. So yes, we're getting ready to celebrate our centennial anniversary. <laughs> Um, next, we'll go with Stephanie. So good day, all. Um, Stephanie Fuji, I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the president for Arapahoe Community College. Um, I have been in this role for, I think, 11 months. Um, Mordecai and I think, Mordecai and I think we started at the same time. Um, so um, just a little bit about me. I've been working in higher education for about 30 years. I joke, I've only worked in higher education, retail and restaurants with a brief stint housekeeping and serving as a blackjack dealer in Reno, Nevada. Um, I have um, I'm worked at public institutions, private institutions, research one and land grant institutions. However, the um, bulk of my career has been the past 25 years in which I was part of the Maricopa Community College Center Maricopa Community Colleges in the greater Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, I have been um, honored to have been able to serve in and worked in student services, um, also worked in um, workforce. I served as a CTE dean um, and then uh, most recently was the vice president of academic affairs at Scottsdale Community College. I've worked um, at the uh, local community college level as well as at the system level. Um, ACC, uh, I believe we are the first two-year college in the greater Denver metro area, um, starting in 1965, um, but became known as Arapahoe Community College in 1970. Um, we are an interesting institution. I would say we are a headcount of about 12,000 students. However, FTE is only about 3,000 students. About 80% of our students are attending part-time, um, which is really interesting. Um, we rely heavily on concurrent enrollment as about 37% um, of our FTE comes from concurrent enrollment. I would also share that um, workforce is very important. CTE, FTE is about close to 38% of the institution's enrollment. Um, we are a suburban community college, again, serving the Denver, um, the South Denver metro area. Uh, what is also interesting, or I guess the unique thing I would offer about ACC is that when everyone was taking a hit in enrollment, ACC did not. And that really speaks to the good work of the people that were here prior to my arrival. Um, and so when the enrollments were declining significantly, um, specifically at my previous system, um, ACC's enrollment was steady and um, our enrollment grew last year. And so I think that makes us a little bit of a unicorn when you consider the national landscape. All right, thanks so much, Stephanie. And last we have Marie from Community College of Denver. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with my Colorado Community College system colleagues and with all of you. Um, 
As Landon said, my name is Marie De Sanctis. I am, or Maria Elena, but most people don't like to say Maria Elena. Um, I am the president of Community College of Denver. Yesterday, I completed 17 months, so I'm just barely ahead of Mordecai and Stephanie um, and somehow have become a very tenured president in our system at 17 months. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, born and raised in South Florida, Colorado. I had never stepped foot in Colorado before coming here uh, to the Community College of Denver and, of course, interviewed for this position in the middle of COVID, so it was all completely completely virtual. Um, so a very unique experience for somebody who graduated as a mechanical engineer and is usually very linear and structured. Um, spent six years in industry as an engineer uh, and then went off to um, change the world and impact students' lives in the public school system in South Florida, um, teaching math and science, became a high school assistant principal, high school principal, um, head of curriculum and instruction for Broward County Public Schools, which is the sixth largest in the country, and got to know my colleagues over at Broward College. Um, many of you may be familiar with Broward. I'm really proud that they are a fourth time top 10 Aspen uh, recipient. And there I was a vice president of student affairs, um, central campus president, and ultimately senior vice president over academics and student services for not only our campuses in South Florida, um, but Broward has 10 uh, SACS accredited uh, institutions across the world. And I am here leading the Community College of Denver and working with some absolutely amazing colleagues to transform lives here um, in beautiful Denver, Colorado. So unique about the Community College of Denver, um, well, number one, the Community College of Aurora is about six or seven miles to our east. And the Community College where Stephanie is, uh, Arapahoe, maybe 10 miles at most to our south. Um, so we, we have uh, colleagues also over at Red Rocks that are about seven or eight miles to our west. So several community colleges all serving the Denver metro area. But most unique is that the Community College of Denver sits on a 150 acre campus alongside the uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver and uh, University of Colorado at Denver. So we believe that we are the only community college in the country that shares a campus with two universities. While there are lots of community colleges that's, that share a campus with one university, uh, we have the pleasure of uh, serving our community alongside two universities. Um, so lots of opportunity for collaboration, lots of opportunity for seamless transfer for students and really addressing uh, the needs of this community from concurrent enrollment all the way through doctoral degrees here on the Auraria campus. And with that, I will leave you with Go Avs. Great, great game last Thank night. Thank you. Um, one thing that you might have caught was the shorter um, tenure of, of the four panelists. Rhonda, you're the most senior of the four. Actually, you're one of the most senior of the 13 in the community college system at this point. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of change in the presidents in um, the community college system and not just vice the presidents, but also vice presidents uh, that level as well. We've seen quite a bit of change there. And I don't think that that's unusual in higher ed. I think that's occurring at a lot of community colleges right now. I know uh, Stephanie and your former system I don't know how many presidencies have been opened down there, but it seems like a lot. And so um, that presents a lot of great opportunity, but it also, you think about, and all, all of ours were, all of our previous presidents left for retirement. They didn't go to another job. So you just kind of lose some of that institutional memory, but you gain a lot of energy and innovation with a lot of new presidents. So that's both hard to see and exciting to see. And Marie, I'm wondering when CCD will be one of the top 10 Aspen finalists. I'm waiting for that year. So, <laughs> um, well, let's get into our questions. We have a few questions for the panelists. Um, I do want for the audience members, um, you can use the Q&A function um, if you have questions along the way. Um, we'll be looking at that and certainly at the end of the, the panel, the, the prepared questions, um, I'll switch over to the Q&A. And if you have any questions in there, I'll, I'll pull them off and read those to our panelists. Um, so we'll start with the first one. 
Um, specifically, um, what strategies you employ to, de to develop partnerships rather than compete with other institutions in the state and system? I think I'm going to start with you, Marie, because you start you you framed it up pretty nicely by just talking about your the the physical location where you're at, but you also even mapped out in miles where the other colleges are in Denver. And so, maybe if you would take that question first. Sure. Thanks, Landon. Um, you know, to me, it really comes down to a really strong foundational belief that the Community College of Denver is competing with the non-consumption of education. I am not. I am not competing with the Community College of Aurora or Arapaho or MSU or or CU. If if the people that are not engaging in post-secondary education would engage, there'd be more people engaging with us than any of than all of us could handle together. And I think that the more that we help our teams understand that, the more that we really help people see that it's not about did the student come to CCD or did they go to MSU on this campus, but rather the student went somewhere. And that ultimately is going to fuel our economy, fuel social mobility, fuel the ability for more people in that family to be able to participate in education. I think that goes a long way in framing these partnerships. Um, partnerships are incredibly important, particularly here on the Auraria campus. So for example, this next year, um, MSU and CCD um, have put forth a proposal to the legislature to fund a joint career center. Um, this is something that we believe in very strongly. Our employer community is asking for. They are not necessarily happy about the three of us being on one campus together and they're having to engage with us um, individually. And it's important for our students. It's important for me as the president of the Community College of Denver to give an opportunity to my students to see and sit alongside students that are applying for jobs as they finish their master's degree. And maybe they're graduating from CCD with, with a short-term certificate and what that could mean to their future. Um, when it comes to health sciences, you know, we, we do a really great job of mapping out those programs that CCD is going to offer within the community. And then those that are partners over at MSU and CU are going to offer in the community to the point where, again, we have joint um, facilities for some of those programs. Um, but at the end of the day, I really think that if we all just focused on making sure that the people who need us the most are making it to us or our neighbor, it truly does not matter to me when I'm talking to, let's say, Denver Public School graduates. I just want them to go somewhere because 48% of those graduates aren't going anywhere. So forget who they lost from ninth to 12th grade, 48% of the graduates are not going to technical college, community college, or university. That is what I'm competing against. That's a really great point. And you can talk a lot about your, your partners on the Auraria campus. Um, I'm interested, maybe if I jump over to Stephanie for a moment, talk a little bit about your, how, how you view partnership um, and you know collaborating it versus competing, but maybe also a little bit about there are five colleges and, and that serve the broader Denver metropolitan area. Um, how might or how do you approach uh, the partnership amongst your colleagues um, at the other community colleges? So I'm going to do this kind of in two parts. You know, the what's interesting about higher education is that we um, I've yet to meet be no yet I've yet to know of an institution that is not funded in part by tuition. We are heavily dependent on tuition for our funding, and so therefore higher education institutions cannibalize each other's enrollment because we are all trying to get a piece of the pie. And not only are we doing this as 
not only is the potential there for us to do it as um, sister institutions, but we see that happening with the universities. We see that happening with the state institutions. And so one of the things that I think ACC has done exceptionally well, and really speaking to the partnerships with Douglas County School District, as well as with um, Colorado State University. And so recognizing that the cannibalization and the competition does not serve anyone well, but these institutions have different strengths and talents. We all have finite resources. And so how are we going to partner to leverage our resources to do what's in the best interest of our community? So I think our Sturm Collaboration Campus is a great example of that out in Castle Rock. Very intentionally designed and being explicit in terms of what our swim lanes are. One of the things that I think, and then the second part of what Landon was asking me about, what I get excited about is um, I come from a system a system of 10 colleges, all individually accredited, and we were cannibalizing each other's enrollment. And we began having conversations about how that is not a healthy or sustainable model. So how can we best work together to regionally approach the needs of the region. And so, you know, Mordecai and I've talked about this, Marilena um, talking about this, really thinking about we don't want to do that. And so how can we embrace an idea that we can regionally approach how we can best address community needs? And that's going to require us, you know, it, again, it's, it's a bit of a mind shift. One of the things I kind of think about, we always want to grow enrollment, grow enrollment, grow enrollment. What point do we say, this is good? Instead of going growing enrollment, let's grow and improve retention and persistence and completion. Keep the students we have, improve completion, and therefore then we, if we work together, and if I know Mordecai has programs at Aurora, why would I create that programs when we're close? If Denver has programs, why am I going to replicate those programs to compete? So one of the things I think we're all looking at is program review and saying, okay, what do I do really well? And where does it make sense to be able to leverage, to share resources, to best meet those needs, to create partnership programs? We are on a grant with um, CCD addressing healthcare needs for the region. And so that's the kind of partnership. So it's being very mindful. It's not thinking just about next year, but thinking about five years thinking about 10 years and really partnering with institutions and that includes K through 12, that includes the universities and it includes business and industry in terms of how we best can negotiate, be explicit as far as expectations, identify swim lanes and then engage in public private partnership because the funding is finite public private partnerships and grants to best deliver on the outcomes that's gonna meet the needs of the region. Great. I do want to get a different perspective. So I do want to jump to Rhonda. I want you to maybe talk a little bit about how the partnership might look where you're at um, in a, a more rural part of the state. Um, but you might also talk a little bit about what we're trying to build, um, what we're calling the Rural College Consortium that's linking the six rural colleges together in, in a variety of ways. Maybe talk a little bit about that too. Um, sure. <clears throat> so it was really eye-opening to me moving out to rural Colorado after being in the Denver metro area for 30 years and my experience on an urban campus at Community College of Denver, because in the rural college setting, we really just experience things a little bit differently than our colleagues um, in uh, the Denver metro area or in you know, more urban settings. For one thing, all of the challenges that higher ed as a whole is facing, whether it's declining enrollments, demographic changes, the pandemic, the economy, they are exacerbated in rural colleges because we just have very little leeway to pivot. We have very thin departments that are sometimes one person deep, maybe two if we're lucky. And if we lose someone, well, I mean, it can be a really big disaster because it's hard to attract qualified faculty and staff to our small communities. 
we don't have a lot of financial aid experts walking around in Trinidad. We have very large geographic service areas. So we spend a lot of time on the road trying to reach our isolated and our sparsely populated communities. Our physical infrastructures are aging. I just mentioned earlier, we're almost 100 years old and it's beginning to show um, pretty badly. And our technology infrastructure is aging. So we came up with this idea um, that if our seven rural colleges in Colorado could work together and leverage our meager resources and ask, go in together and ask the legislature to help us with an investment in technology, that this would help us better serve the needs of our students. Um, we could begin to standardize um, our, our classroom technology, upgrade our classroom technology, as well as our network um, infrastructure. And we also wanted to be able to expand our program offerings that we are able to offer to our communities. And we're gonna do this primarily through, guess what, video-based classroom to classroom delivery across our seven campuses. So we're kind of going back to the early days of video-based distance learning. We're starting out um, with a cybersecurity program and we're looking at um, including criminal justice in the Rural College Consortium. So I'll stop there. And um, Landon, does that explain um, the Rural College Consortium? It does, and I'm glad you brought up cybersecurity because you had mentioned just last week at the president's meeting that you lost your cybersecurity faculty. And in a consortium, there might be another faculty member at another college that you could then leverage to not have any sort of gaps of service of courses. If you're independent on your own, you know, how long would it take you to replace that person when you could maybe rely on one of the other colleges in the consortium to help out? So. Yeah, and we may not be able to. So that's why this idea of, of relying on each other is um, so powerful. Yep, great. Um, I'm gonna move us along to the next question. Um, thanks everyone for talking about partnership in your unique um, environments. The next question is, um, how do you actualize innovation and cultivate a culture that invites innovation? Um, I'm gonna start with you, Mordecai, if you're willing to dive into that. Thanks, Landon. I think that uh, there's so much disruption that is happening in and around society, right? The, the spaces and places in which we dwell and work. And so now the, the question really becomes as educators that is serving in today's time is how do we embrace those disruptions and seek new ways to educate and to serve uh, and to have, help students uh, achieve their learning outcomes and build partnerships. Uh, and a bit of this is truly the responsibility that we have as presidents, but as educators to create spaces for innovation, which means then that there's no such thing as failure. Uh, we just found what didn't work. Now let's quickly move and pivot to the next thing. And so I think that um, as I work here with my fellow colleagues uh, as presidents, uh, and this is an amazing group to serve with here in this amazing state, but that we have that responsibility to say, okay, let's try some things out. Let's, let's, let's pilot some opportunities. Let's share some resources. Let's look at, at, at solutions in a, in a new and different way that we haven't before. Uh, and essentially saying that no and failure is not an option uh, and that everything is an opportunity to try to transform the student experience. Uh, the second part of that I think is, is also creating systems of innovation. So it's more than just saying, let's innovate, let's try new things until we get something right. I think it also requires, uh, and anyone that's watching this, to, to keep in mind that you must have a system for innovation. How are we properly resourcing or uh, resource allocations? Uh, have a system for resource allocation. Are we tying our strategic plans our objectives and our goals back into the day-to-day -day operations and tracking how we're resourcing or new ways in which we can resource the desired outcomes of these strategic plans. So it truly is a systematic approach to this. It's more than just lip service and it's certainly more than putting up a banner around the campus, quoting yourselves to be an innovative institution. And Mordecai, I know you're, you're working through quite a bit on your own strategic plans. I know you're looking deeply in academic affairs and student support services. Um, are you or how are you building in 
whether it's resources like money or people or whatever to foster innovation as you're building out those those new plans for the future i think it starts my friend with quality assessment right it's truly taking a look at our current systems measuring those against uh, what uh, Rhonda's uh, key performance uh, measures and metrics. Uh, I'm so used to calling them key P KPIs. And so since working with Rhonda, I now call them KPMs. But those key performance measures, those metrics, those indicators, um, and really being honest about are we achieving what we seek to achieve? I think through the quality assessment, now it becomes, okay, let's look at our people. Let's look at our infrastructure. Let's look at our systems and where we have those opportunities. And are we properly resourced and, and uh, systematized to be able to meet the needs of our students uh, and then putting a plan in place. Again, failure is not an option. No is not a, 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 the appropriate response. It's uh, it's about taking a look at how to get there um, and then making sure that we're putting in measures of accountability as well, holding ourselves accountable um, and, and not allowing excuses to get in the way of what needs to be transformative work to, to meet the needs of our, our uh, communities. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to to chime in a little bit on this question around innovation and, and cultivating that culture on your campus, either where you're currently at or maybe even where you were prior. So I like this question because I'm old. And I, when I say that I've been around, um, not in a bad way, but, but um, for the past 10 years, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Everyone talks about innovation. Everybody wants to talk about innovation. It's like the new sexy thing for the past 10 years. We all talk about innovation, but to truly, truly be innovative, you have to look at the institution's capacity and appetite for failure and the consequences of failure, not just from a personnel perspective, but from a culture you know, I forget who said it, but culture eats strategy. And it's so, so true. So if the culture is risk adverse, if the people, if the leadership is risk adverse, or there's consequences that are so severe, meaning, you know, we kind of joke, you see presidents come and go. And part of that is, is that you have um, education, higher education. We are so traditional in our structures. Why we, why we take the summer off? Because the rest of the world doesn't take the summer off, but yet we take the summer off. You know, you look at our contracting, you look at our rules, you, you know, we're trying to address equity, but the rules have been set up by people who typically benefited from the old rules. So if they're in if their positions power now, why do they want to rip those rules apart? And so you need to really be mindful. So what one of the things that's been very interesting, just even in my transition to ACC, my predecessor told everyone at the college, I don't know if she told them this way, she's probably far more eloquent than me, but she told everyone at the institution to expect change. The new president's going to come in, she can change anything, she can change it, and prepared the institution to psychologically be aware, to be prepared, to try and get comfortable with this notion of change. So, cause there's a psychological part that if you're going to change, if you're going to risk, you know, people stay, people sometimes would prefer dysfunction to be comfortable, you know? And so you really gotta be able to challenge that. And so I think that's part of trying to be a culture that's gonna be transparent. You know, one of my um, VPs likes to ask everyone in this interview, how do you feel about failure? Because around here we fail and we fail fast and we try to learn from it. And that's really what I think the institution has done. And particularly at ACC, we spend a lot of time and energy being very aggressive on the grants front. We will chase just about anything that we think we can deliver on. So that, you know, again, because, and we don't get them all the time, but there's not a consequence that says, oh, you wasted time, energy, because that's sometimes the narrative you get. But I really think it's important to be aware and mindful and to be able to discern the institution and the system's appetite for, um, for change and risk-taking and failure, because those are all part of the reality of truly being innovative. I so appreciate, and I've heard other presidents on here talk about the 
willingness to take risks and to accept that failure will happen because um, I think about the times when I've learned the most, whether it's in my personal or professional life, it's when I kind of went out on a limb, did something maybe I didn't, I wasn't necessarily comfortable with, and I may have failed um, in doing so. And so it's, it's a really nice feeling to have leaders in the system who think similarly, that, that it's okay to fail and it's okay to take risks, not disastrous risks that are gonna bankrupt your college, but um, you know, risks, some. And so um, I, I did wanna mention the polls. Are they, are they visible to people? I don't know if I can just see them. Oh, okay, so the results are visible. Um, so you can see here, there were two questions that we asked the group um, around how innovative is your institution on a scale of one to five, five being high, um, that a good percentage were in the three, four, and five. Um, and I would, you know, and Rhonda might know this from, you're used to, you were at the system office, you've been around the system for a while. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in just my five or six years here is the change in in the culture with a shift in leadership um, and that really I felt like there was a lot of um, saying no to things to saying yes to things. I think our current chancellor leads with yes, um, not in a um, in a, a kind of cavalier way, but in a calculated way. And I think that has changed the way that we partner. And I think it also has reflected in what we get from the legislature and in grants and other sorts of things. And so um, that has also led our, our system. And I think each of the colleges, especially with your leadership, um, to be more innovative as well as a result of that. And so the second one is related, but it's around risk, how risk averse um, is your culture um, and a little bit more spread out, um, kind of in the middle there. Um, and I, I do wonder if that has to do a little bit with kind of where we are um, coming out of a pandemic, uh, being a little bit more cautious, a little bit more nervous about what doing something might um, affect our institutions. So, um, but thank you all for, for, for filling that out. We will have one other, I do have one other question. I'm going to be asking the the uh, panelists as I'm doing that. If members of the audience, if you could um, write in the chat, so it's not going to be a formal poll, but just put into the chat um, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing um, as an organization over the next twelve months? What what that biggest challenge or maybe top two challenges that you foresee? And I'm going to ask. Um, our panelists. I'm going to start with Marie um, and just ask you, um, how are you innovating to meet some of those challenges facing your institution? I mentioned some of them more from a system perspective at the beginning when I talked about funding, enrollment, um, and um, a few other things that we're definitely seeing as a system, but what are some, some things that you're doing um, to meet those challenges at your institution? Sure. Thank you, Landon. Um, and I'll try to keep it brief because I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, but I think one of the ways that CCD really started to significantly address challenges here in our Denver community was by starting about 15 non-credit certificates this last year, which is just unbelievable for um, higher ed to move that quickly and stand up um, that type of presence within our community. Um, so we have over 700 people that have graduated with short-term certificates that are now finding themselves in jobs that are a whole lot better for their career trajectory than working at Wendy's or McDonald's or Target or any of those types of uh, places uh, of employment. Um, so we're really excited about that and what it has meant for our community. I think our business community has really stood up and taken notice and um, is has shifted the rhetoric about how slow higher ed is to respond to their needs because of what CCD has been able to do. I think the most uh, interesting innovation is on our horizon. Right now we are out for funding um, and have several interested funders. So I will preview for you guys that it is called Allie and not just because my daughter's named Allie or CU's president's name, uh, daughter's name is also Allie, but it stands for the Auraria Learning and Employer Ecosystem. 
Um, so several phases to this project. Uh, the first is empowering learners with their own records of learning through a digital wallet. So if a student decides that they're going to take some courses from the Community College of Aurora and some from CCD and some from Arapaho and some from CU and some from MSU and some from Red Rocks, um, when they go to get a job, they're not going to have to run around to all of our institutions and request transcripts. They'll have them all in their own digital wallet on their phone, uh, hopefully tied to our My Colorado app, which is where we all have our blockchain empowered uh, driver's licenses. Uh, the next step of that project will be to create skills based transcripts. So we hope to leave the 19th century transcript behind and uh, help our employers understand what students learned instead of just English 101, Psychology 101, College Algebra, what skills are they actually walking into their place of employment with? And we really hope that that will help power our governor's initiative to really support skills-based hiring. Um, incredibly important, particularly as we have such incredible talent pipeline challenges here in Denver. Right now we have over 200,000 job openings in Denver, 112,000 on the unemployment list. And of course, I don't need to tell you that those 112,000 don't exactly match those 200,000 openings. So right now our business community is worried about losing the companies that are here, uh, worried about attracting companies to our metro area. Uh, so we need to find a way to find that talent pipeline, and it's probably not going to be solely based on four-year degrees and an inability to match people to their skills. Uh, what we hope to do from that point is then build that employer part of the ecosystem. So we will have skills-based transcripts, they have skills-based job postings, and we will do what LinkedIn tried to do. Um, except this will be in a verified and immutable fashion. So you can't just tell tales about your skills. They will, they will be completely verified. I will endorse everyone later. Um, and be able to make matches for people. And this is really important to me because I find so many times that our community college students are very myopic about the job that they are looking for. They may have gotten a degree in data analytics and they're looking for a job that says data analytics, and we all know that they are qualified for a whole host of jobs that don't use the words data analytics within that job description. And they may not have a pushy mother like me who is running all over town saying, hey, my son just graduated from or my daughter just graduated from and making those connections. So I hope to close that social network gap for some of our students through uh, the power of technology. And um, I think that that is going to be a huge value add for the students uh, that come here to the Auraria campus and then ultimately throughout the state of Colorado, we hope that this will uh, become an entire state initiative. Um, I'm going to ask Rhonda the, with this same question, but I also want to reference just a couple of the comments that people have been putting in chat. So. Rhonda, if you want to shape your answers around this, feel free. If not, we'll get to it. But um, there were a number of comments around um, turnover. And we started with that at the very beginning. Um, just the turnover at in whatever agency they're in, they're seeing a lot of brand new people. Of course, we're seeing that in Colorado in our community colleges as well. Um, there's, of course, enrollment concerns, keeping up with technology. And Marie, you talked to, you know about bringing just the, the, the skills-based transcripts and that process into today's century and not, did you say 19th century? <laughs> yes. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of comments around enrollment. Turnover was probably the biggest. And then some of the technological pieces, whether it's the technology itself or how it relates to online teaching and learning. So Rhonda, anything that, that you might address and how you uh, keep up with some of these challenges or innovate in this space? Sure, that, that's a lot to cover, but I can definitely address turnover and enrollment challenges. And let me just say, Marie, I love those ideas. And I, I really hope that all of the colleges in Colorado will be able to benefit from your experiences there with this new digital transcript. Um, but I, I guess I would say in response to some of the chat that we, we really have been responding to um, kind of a, a crisis um, environment, a desperation environment in terms of enrollment. And we, we, 
we kind of came to the conclusion that we're not going to survive all of these crises we've been experiencing unless we make some changes. Um, we are in a demographic drought. We've been losing enrollment for 10 years. Um, and as much as we hope that's going to change, we really don't expect it to change dramatically anytime soon. We're hoping to stabilize the enrollment losses that we've experienced. Um, we are doing what we can. We're trying to reach out to new audiences. We're recruiting out of state. We're trying to better serve adult learners by offering more evening weekend programs, more online. We've got this rural consortium we're working on. We've gone really big into Second Chance Pell in serving justice-involved students. We're expanding our concurrent enrollment partnerships. But what we really hadn't done until this year is to sit down and really assess our staffing size relative to our student size and whether each program we're offering is really sustaining itself. So after a lot of analysis and consultation with faculty, and this has been over a two-year time period, we ended up sunsetting seven programs this year, and that resulted in a reduction in force of both faculty and staff. And so between the rifts and also holding open a number of vacancies, we are going into next fiscal year with 11 fewer FTE employees. Um, and that's, you know, for a large institution, that may not be a lot, but for a small rural college, that's a lot. Um, it's been hard on morale, but ultimately this is going to enable us to invest in our core strengths and focus on what is essential to our communities and what has the potential to grow. And it's also enabling us to invest in our people. So we've provided salary increase, increases this year um, greater than um, what, the, um, what was the minimum for most institutions in Colorado. And we also addressed a number of market equity increases where we were paying lower than the market average. So we're hoping that's going to address some of the turnover that we've been experiencing. And I really hate to use this, like downsizing as an example of innovation, but it is something that's extremely difficult to do. And we do think it's going to enable us to pursue the kind of innovation that supports our core mission by really investing in people and strengthening our existing programs. All right, thanks so much, Rhonda. Um, we have just a few minutes left, um, and I put into chat if you have, if audience members have any other questions, feel free to type them into the Q and A. There is one question that we have right now, so I'm going to ask. Um, maybe, well, I'm just going to ask it and then see which of the panelists want it. I'm not going to uh, pick on someone. So the question is, so the audience can can hear the question, with so many institutions wrestling with both modes of instruction and modes of work for faculty and staff, what priorities have you set and what role does professional development play in supporting faculty and staff? Any of the panelists want to take a shot at that? Two, yeah, two parts to that, um, and I'm I'm thinking about which which to. I think it's. Let me start with the the latter first, and just say that um, as we talked about resourcing earlier, it is so imperative that we create. We're currently doing it now at CCA. We've developed a a whole new program, and we've hired a team member that's focusing in on this uh, for professional development um, for our team members because again that disruption in the ways in which we are properly not only resourcing, but preparing uh, our team members to be able to serve in today's time is critical and crucial, uh, as well as creating new communities to be able to share best practices with one another. So I would just say that it is so important that not only do we say the change needs to occur, but we properly uh, ensure that our team members are prepared to serve within this season of change. I would just offer up, you know, the question I believe talked about professional development. I truly, truly believe if you want to change as the student's experience, you need to have strategies and interventions with the people who facilitate that student's experience. And that is with our faculty. So I'm a strong believer in professional development of faculty, you know, um, 
faculty must have a growth mindset. We are learning institutions. And so therefore faculty have to recognize the need to learn and adapt and look, um, be um, reflective practitioners of teaching and learning. And then also with your staff, you know, people switch to online so quickly because we had to with COVID. And I had faculty that said they never, the scientists, you can never do that online. But COVID hit and they had to do it. And then all of a sudden, they never were going to do it. All of a sudden, they were forced to do it. And now they're all like, oh my gosh, I want to get better at it. And so therefore, we have a responsibility. If you're going to ask the faculty or you're going to ask any group to engage in change, we have a responsibility to provide professional development and support to give them the tools and the resources to be able to do that. But if you don't have the proper assessment, you know, are the faculty wanting to teach online because it's convenient? You know, and if they want to teach online, do they really want to improve their practice? So you got to figure out and assess what the issue is. And then you must have the intervention or professional development um, that's going to best meet the need from their perspective, but then also awareness from the institution's perspective. Landon, I'll jump right back in there just to say I failed to, to answer the first part of that question. Now that I've seen it, I had to process that. In terms of priorities, what I would just say is, is that for us here at CCA, it's really what is the desired outcome and what do we have in terms of available personnel and systems to meet that desired outcome? Uh, and that conversation is helping to shift the ideology behind what has to be a face-to-face -face experience or what, has, or what can be a virtual experience. Um, and we're watching the impact of what's happening in, in the market right now on the expectation with a lot of available personnel for key roles to say, I really want to do this work virtually. And there are some spaces and opportunities where we can do that. And then there's other spaces and opportunities where we got to say, well, hold on, we still need a, a bit of, of your presence at the campus. So I think that we'll be in this space for quite some time as we level out uh, to make a determination as to what our new reality will be. I've been waiting to say this. You muted, my friend. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> it has to happen every single meeting. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to take with the last remaining minute or two before we kind of wrap up, there was a question from Russ, uh, Russ Poulin. Um, if one of you would, would take this, how has the digital divide affected your students and how have you addressed it? Um, well, I, I can take a stab at that, Russ. It's it, being in a rural location, of course, I'm sure you understand we have we definitely experience the digital divide more acutely maybe than others, uh, because we don't have widely available high speed internet access throughout our service area. Um, this became even more apparent during the pandemic when uh, when we went fully remote and um, we found that some students simply couldn't connect. So we had to do things like um, provide wireless access from our parking lots. And um, I think that was a, a common strategy at other rural institutions, certainly maybe even some of the urban institutions. And, and believe me, our parking lots were filled up with students who were working from their cars. Um, and we used some of our um, stimulus funds to do things like that. We also um, provided laptop computers to everyone. There was a big laptop um, drive through the Colorado Department of Higher Education. And I think we were the recipient of nearly 100 of those laptops so that we, we could make sure that all students had laptops available to work on. Um, but it, I will say it remains a problem. Um, people who live in outlying areas, if they do have high-speed internet, they're probably paying upwards of $200 a month for it. And in today's world, that's, that's becoming more and more unaffordable. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Megan. But before I do, I want to just thank the four of you for your participation and your, your thoughtful answers um, and discussion today. Um, if we could, if the, if the audience could all give you a round of applause, you won't see it, but if they could maybe do it in chat. 
Um, I uh, just want to express my appreciation for that. And Megan, I'll turn it to you. I know you're going to close this out. Yes, thank you, Landon. Thanks for facilitating this excellent conversation. Thank you, friends, for being here. This is excellent. I really appreciate you sharing. And as Landon said, these experiences in Colorado transcend every state border. So thank you. We have another um, exciting event coming up with, it, and this is in partnership with Witchy as well. So save the date for a fireside chat with Goldie from the Chronicle of Higher Education, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And I just wanna acknowledge our very valuable WTEC, WCET sponsors. Without them, we couldn't continue to do the, the volume of webcasts and events that we do. And our supporting members, California State University, Colorado State University, Michigan State University, and the University of Florida. And these are the Alliance partners. So big kudos to them. And again, thank you for being here. Thanks for the great conversation. And I hope everyone has a chance to relax and recuperate this summer. Take care all.